you amazing, hardworking, thoughtful human beings. This is episode 39 of Stand Up. Today's question, what the hell is this coronavirus, huh? Hey guys, welcome to the Classroom of Life. That is Stand Up with Pete Dominic, which drops wherever you get your podcasts three days a week. I'm continuing my work of fighting apathy and ignorance on my journey to learn more about the world and myself. Every show, I welcome an expert or more, sometimes three, even four. What am I, Dr. Seuss? We have smart, entertaining guests on to talk about the issues, ideas, and problems that matter to you, your family, your community, your health, physical and mental well-being, and the planet, of course. Today, we're talking to New England School of Medicine, Dr. Megan May on coronavirus, everything you need and want to know or not want to know about that. I also called my brother up. We talked about Bernie Sanders. We talked a little bit about impeachment. That's coming up after my conversation with Dr. Megan May. I have some reaction, and I'll have others' reaction on the loss of NBA legend and one of the most beloved Americans, Kobe Bryant, who died tragically in a helicopter crash along with his 13-year-old daughter and three others. But first, I wanted to give you an update on me and my journey, and actually how Kobe Bryant's death and the death of his daughter puts things into perspective for me, as the randomness of life so often can. So a few weeks ago, I started talking about how much I've been struggling with the loss of my job, which I had so much of my identity and, of course, my financial future, our financial future and my family tied up. And, you know, I, I didn't at first want to talk about it publicly so openly because, number one... I don't want to depress you with my situation. I've always considered my work enlightening and and entertaining. We learned together, and I did my best to make horrible news and issues interesting, and I always tried to deliver an optimistic view on things. So when I lost my job at Sirius and I immediately launched the podcast, I was careful not to let my personal situation, problems, setbacks, whatever you want to call them, on the air publicly or in social media, but eventually they started leaking them out first with Wajahat Ali right here on the show. Go back and listen to that. And then, of course, with Henry Winkler, Lisa Lampanelli. And then the floodgates just opened. I came clean here on the podcast and I uh, social media as well that I was basically an absolute wreck for almost three months. And I have been really surprised and motivated and inspired by the support and honesty that sharing my struggle has been met with. And the other point is I just never wanted the show to be about me. It was always something I would always share little nuggets about my personal life, things that have gone right, things that have gone wrong, my marriage, my my kids. But it was always an outward facing and and focused on the world around us. But that's changing because I'm learning that if I'm honest about my struggle and I'm role modeling good behavior for other men and people in general to do their level best to share and be open about whatever you're dealing with. And I've heard from so many people who've been in my situation. I've gotten so much advice and support, and I'm sharing that as publicly as I can so you can benefit from it as well. And I'm personally doing a lot better as a result. Last two weeks have been really uh, game changers, and I want to talk about a few reasons why as we continue here, the books I'm reading, the conversations I'm having, the podcasts I'm listening to, everything that's improving my life. Uh, One person who's been following and supporting me is Susan Hendricks, who is an anchor on the HLN network, Weekend Express. She's been really sympathetic to my situation. She even invited me on her uh, show to share a little with her in hopes that it might inspire others to be more open and take the stigma off of sharing your personal challenges and struggles. And I wanted to share that with you now. As many as three in every five Americans are lonely. That's according to a new study, and it could be getting worse, whether it's due to working from home, a career change, retirement, or maybe you're on your cell phone all the time. Loneliness can compromise your mental and physical health. Joining me now, comedian and host of the new Stand Up with Pete Dominic podcast and friend of the network, friend of myself, friend of the show. Pete, it's great to have you on because I follow you on social media, and I saw that you were talking about anxiety and depression because you worked at Sirius XM for what 12 years and then all of a sudden life changed yeah uh, back in October of this year I basically lost my dream job and uh, it's been a, the, the most difficult three months uh, of my life and I'm still really struggling and I wanted to 
be honest about it. I want to be mm-hmm. transparent about it because I think that sharing my struggle, especially as a man, was was really important. I've always been honest with my audience, but at first, Susan, honestly, I, I was faking it. I was trying to be that same happy, inspiring, positive guy that I've always been because mm-hmm. I've, I've had a lot of privilege in my life, but I had to be honest. I started dealing with serious anxiety and serious depression. And when I came out and, and have been open about it, uh, the response to it has been been really, really overwhelming and inspiring itself. And I'm still in the middle of it. Yeah, I saw um, a celebrity director, so many people, men reaching out saying, look, I got through this. You can, too. Yeah. You're a dad of two girls and a husband. And you say your wife literally had to pick you up from the floor certain days. Yeah, more more than a few days, you know. Uh, My wife is an amazing woman who has dealt with all kinds of adversity and abuse her entire life. And as a result of that, she's been able to develop all kinds of coping strategies. She's always been searching for ways to get better, to be better, to feel better from adolescence to, to school to even, of course, motherhood, which is an issue a lot of women struggle with. And so when I... When I lost my job and finally opened up to her and and was honest with her about what I was dealing with, she came uh, and put her cape on and saved me. And ironically enough, Susan, she told me that losing my job saved our marriage because I finally realized how important she was and, and, and gave her the value that she so desperately deserved for the 19 and a half years that we've been together. When we spoke yesterday and you said that to me, it really gave me the chills to think this situation, maybe it happened for you and not to you in a way because it made your relationship with your wife better. You said more time with the kids, but you're not denying that it's still difficult. You have a new podcast. How has that road been on starting over? It's 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 been the most challenging uh, time of my life. You know, 44 years old, I'm at my peak earning potential. I'm this, you know, b- big deal at, at Sirius XM interviewing all these academics and journalists and celebrities. And now I'm walking around in sweatpants talking to Alexa and talking <laughs> to myself. The podcast has been really exciting to do. But my wife taught me that breakthroughs or breakdowns lead to breakthroughs. And so mm-hmm. I'm having a lot of breakthroughs and I'm learning all kinds of different ways to cope from meditation to changing my diet to exercise. And my daughters have been, you know, they're 12 and 15, as you know, and they've been really Mm -hmm. supportive. And I just think it's very important that men open up and share because I have heard from so many amazing people have gone through much more difficult uh, ideas and issues and they're sharing with me and they're rooting for me, which is why I'm really psyched that you had me on to talk about it today. And I'm so excited that you are. And as you were speaking, we were looking at years past and how many years and what you've done and who you've spoken to. But uh, connecting, I think, again, with your wife is huge and your two girls and just the podcast, which I love. I do want to point out Pete's podcast, Stand Up with Pete, Dominic and five stars, Pete, five stars. Thank Not you very just saying much. That. Thanks for having me. Anybody that's watching can reach out and we'll continue to support each other. All right, Pete. Thank you. Thanks, Susan. And, oh, my gosh, the reaction to that was so positive. A whole bunch of folks, actually complete strangers, of course, did reach out that were watching HLN. I wanted to read a couple of the emails. I got tweets. I got Facebook messages as well. Here is a guy named Purvis who said, I saw you on HLN this morning talking about your recent experience with anxiety and depression due to losing your job. First, I'd like to say bravo for being vulnerable and transparent with your experience. It's been said that men scream at a frequency only they can hear. I'm glad so many men are echoing louder than ever. I'm a life coach who has a niche in working with men, teaching them how to navigate through vulnerable spaces like anxiety and other mental health issues, but more importantly, teaching men how to become actualized in more ways other than output or what we produce. You're a husband, Pete, a father, a friend, an inspiration, etc. So much more than a content producer and a comedian. My desire is to teach men that wholeness is possible. Anyhow, continue on your journey. Just wanted to commend you. Your wife is correct. Breakdowns do lead to breakthroughs. But let me add that clarity precedes a breakthrough as well. For probably the first time in a while, you got clarity on how you are more than what you were at SiriusXM. How about that? You know, I share that. And I share these not because I want to be virtuous and, and, and make myself seem important. It feels good to have folks care and reach out to me. But I share them because I want you to benefit from the advice that so many amazing people are giving me. I have this awesome spot in the media, and I know all of these different people, smart people, influential people, and I've been reaching out to them. I want to share with you 
what these amazing people are sharing with me in hopes that we can all benefit from it together. Maybe I'll at some point put this all together in some more organized format, a book, an essay, a TED Talk. Certainly it's all going into my comedy act, but I want us to all be able to benefit from what I'm going through. You share with me what you're going through and we'll keep this going and being productive and healthier mentally and physically. And now I just want to mention that the death of Kobe Bryant and his 13-year-old daughter, as well as at least seven others on a helicopter yesterday, of course, sent shockwaves through not only the sports world, but the Grammys were last night and uh, most of America internationally as well. Kobe Bryant, one of the most famous and respected and celebrated basketball players in the history of the game, uh, of course, there is a stain on his legacy because he was accused of and went through a trial uh, for rape. Uh, so there will always be that. He was found innocent of those charges. But it seemed like no, not many people at least were thinking about that yesterday. And, uh, you know, it's just one of those horrible losses where it does give you a perspective on how precious life is. Of course, I had, like everybody else, a, a, a number of reactions, you know, that this woman, his wife, just lost her husband and her 13-year-old. I mean, that's in, uh, incomprehensible. Not to mention the seven others that were on the helicopter that all had families who lost them. But they're around. Like that post you ignored. Don't leave them on unread. No matter what's gone down or going down, today's a good day to do it. And as a matter of fact, I got a text from uh, a friend of mine, a guy I'm not really close with, but still he was on this podcast and really great guy. Comedian Mike Kaplan just texted me randomly. Pete, how are you? Taking this opportunity to reach out to let friends know they are loved and appreciated whether they are, whether or not they are basketball people. I believe it's always a good time to tell friends you care about them. And now it's one subset of always love you. How about that? So that's really interesting that he did that. And I'm going to pay it forward and send that type of text to a few people. I hope that you will as well. And let me just play a couple of reactions from around the sports world for you. Here is ESPN Sports Center analyst Jay Williams with a very honest, emotional take. Today's just a really, today's a tough day. Today's a hard day. And I hope that um, everybody at home, you, you give that person next to you um, whatever thing you have wrong in your life with them if this might be small or big let that shit go it doesn't matter i know i curse i'm sorry it's okay none of that stuff matters man this is uh it's about life and uh being precious with every damn second we have here because it, from somebody who knows who almost happened to me it, like that man it's just over it's done randomly randomly arbitrarily and uh you know his his four girls and his wife we, uh, we need to come around them and support them and help them. And the NBA should cancel all games today. Um, I don't really know what else to say. Not much else to say, Jay. That was really, really well said. And let's go to another NBA legend and Los Angeles Lakers legend, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who always offers something brilliant in times like these. It's very difficult for me to put in words how I feel about the loss of Kobe Bryant. As a young boy, I met him when he was 11 or 12 years old. I was friends with his dad, Joe. We were uh, former uh, adversaries. Joe pe played for the 76ers, but he was a good friend and uh, someone that I shared a friendship with. And it's hard for me to uh, understand now how this is affecting Joe and his wife. So uh, for, to Kobe's family, I, I want to send my most sincere and heartfelt uh, regrets and prayers. And my thoughts are with you guys. Kobe was a, an incredible family man. He loved his wife and, and daughters. He was an incredible athlete and a leader in a, in a lot of ways. He inspired a whole generation of young athletes. He was one of the first ones to leave high school and come to the NBA and do so well, dominating the game and becoming one of the best scorers that the Los Angeles Lakers has ever seen. I had the privilege of being there when he scored his 81-point game 
and it was something that I will always remember as one of the highlights of uh, the things that I have learned and observed in sports. Kobe, my thoughts are with you. Absolutely. Rest in peace, young man. It, this loss is, it's, it's just hard to comprehend. Go with God. Well said, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And, of course, there were performance dedicated performances dedicated at the Grammys, which took place on the same day that Kobe Bryant and those other eight souls lost their lives. A lot of performances dedicated to them. And America in shock today with the loss of a huge sports legend, Kobe Bryant. And I just wanted to mention the perspective that it gives me. I'm sitting here talking about my setbacks and my misfortunes, if you will. And you're reminded in times like these how precious life is and how quickly it can end and how random it all can be. And so uh, I think it's also interesting to look at the collective reaction on social media that we now have. It, it seems like it's actually a good time for social media. What do you think? When in times like these and, and, and people get to react and share their thoughts and I think uh, come together and create a, a sense of community after a terrible tragedy. Speaking of tragedy, the epidemic, the outbreak in China that has now spread to a number of other countries of this, what's called being called coronavirus, is really scary. It's very important, and it's just the kind of thing that I want to talk about with experts here on Stand Up. And I'm lucky to have a very smart woman who is a listener and who reached out to me and suggested that we have a conversation. Her name is Dr. Megan May. She is a professor at the University of New England. She's got a whole bunch of degrees. This is what she does. This is what she studies. And we had a fascinating, important conversation on Saturday, and then we went back and updated it last night with the new numbers. Everything you need to know about coronavirus with Dr. Megan May right now on Stand Up. And coming up after that, conversation with my brother about impeachment, and Bernie Sanders, and more after this with Dr. Megan May. Okay, so we all need to learn uh, all of a sudden about a new virus that has apparently originated in China. A city larger than New York, it apparently has like 11 million people in China, is on lockdown. They are being quarantined right now. Apparently, they knew about this virus or they found it in this city of Wuhan around New Year's, and it has started to spread in China. And last week, a longtime listener of the SiriusXM show reached out to me and she said, hey, uh, I'm an epidemiologist, or I, I study vaccines and immunology, and said, you may want to talk about this. Let me know if you do. And I didn't get back to her until... Uh, it, I found out there were a couple of cases of coronavirus is what it's being called right now until we sp find out more specifically what it is in the U.S. I didn't care until the U.S. I reached back out to Dr. Megan May, who's joining me right now on the phone from Maine, where she is a professor at the University of New England. She's an expert on immunology and infectious disease. She's done a ton of research on this, and she has a lot to teach us. Megan, welcome to Stand Up. Thank you very much for reaching out to me. I'm sorry I waited until I thought I was in danger. I'm a selfish <laughs> horrible American. <laughs> no worries at all. Uh, that's, that's pretty standard, I think. Yeah. I called you an epidemiologist. That's not right. Did I say that? Uh, not exactly, but that's all right. All right. Um, all... Close, uh, close enough. Same family of nerdy, you know, people who talk about diseases because we're ghouls and whatnot. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs> we're, and we're glad to have you because uh, the, we need these scientists, scientists and ghouls out there doing exactly what you do, <laughs> because this is really obviously important and serious stuff. Major breaking news as it's developed. It's like day after day. But first, just explain to me, Megan, how it works in the world health community. I know it's different country to country, but but each country is supposed to share information of any type of of epidemic or outbreak, and then they share it. You have this uh, system called ProMed Alert that all the the nerds and scientists and doctors like yourself are have available to them. How does it work to track these things when they begin? Well, there are a few different um, ways that this happens, and of course, most of us have heard of the World Health Organization. So this is a major 
international organization, member of the diplomatic community. Um, and this organization is the formal one, right? This is where people report their outbreaks of severe diseases and they can request help on the ground if they need it. Um, what you referred to before and, and where I first learned about this is something called ProMed. Um, so this is actually a listserv that is moderated by um, actually a, an epidemiologist in the U.S. So he works for the Massachusetts Department of Health. So, you know, neighbor of mine, if you like. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is an initiative that's run by um, volunteer scientists and we um it's a it's an email listserv and i get several alerts per day about different diseases that are um reportable severe all around the world uh, and it gives a sense of where outbreaks are happening how many people are affected if they're spreading from one country to another or staying rather local and what also happens through this listserv and a few others like it is that you'll sometimes get a message that says unexplained illness in China in this, in this case. And then when you open it, there tends to be information about how many people are affected, what their symptoms are and any kind of hints as to what might be going on. And then people can respond to it and say, that sounds like X, Y, or Z, or people can respond to it and say, Yikes, I don't know what that is. Keep us posted. Do you guys um, e- actually say yikes? I don't know what that is on the, <laughs> on your uh, Dr. Slack pro med alert. All right. So uh, no, no actual yikes is, but I think everyone says them out loud to themselves. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's that's terrifying. The world you live <laughs> in is so. OK, what is coronavirus and how deadly is it? Is the second part of the question even fair? Do we know enough about it to know how deadly it is? Right. So the se- I'll, I'll do the second part first, actually, because it's really difficult to say at this moment, because every morning that we wake up, you know, here on the East Coast of the United States, it's been an entire day going by in China and there's all kinds of new information. So the um, the mortality rate, in other words, how deadly this is, looked different on Tuesday than it did on Wednesday, than it did on Thursday, than it did on Friday. And so uh, the the complicated part is that we're still trying to figure this this sort of thing out. And so when, when it looks like something is, well, it's not so deadly. And the, you know, the, the four people as of Tuesday who've died were all you know, much older and they had underlying conditions. Some were diabetic, some had kidney failure. And then you wake up Wednesday and it's, oh, geez, now it's, it's been eight people. And then you wake up Thursday and all right, now it's, you know, 14, now it's 17. And, and it, it becomes um, clearer and clearer that we're still in kind of the fact finding phase here. And so, when we're talking about, is this something that, you know, we're all going to die imminently from versus right. <laughs> yeah. this is no big deal and it's, it's fine. Um, we don't quite know that yet. And I know it's a really frustrating thing to hear because you really want somebody in like a stiff white coat saying, here are your risks. If you do this, you will be fine and nothing will happen or you should go get a mask because we're all going to drop in. You know, do those two masks, weeks time. Right. Do those masks work? For this, they actually work reasonably well. Yeah. Ah. Or it seems like they would. Okay. Well, that's good to know. I mean, and, and these uh, these viruses, right? Virus, am I using the right word? Yep. They, they spread, I mean, just a little bit, Megan, if you would, Dr. Megan May, if you would, <laughs> it's such a great doctor name, about the history <laughs> of how these viruses spread because as uh, as population has grown as trade and travel has increased in terms of airplanes and trade in terms of globalization and then adding, I think I can throw in climate change, because if we're talking about viruses spread by insects, specifically mosquitoes, 
uh, mm-hmm. than that matters. H- give us a little bit of a primer on the, the history of how these viruses spread, given the variables I just threw out. Um, let me address the climate change piece first and say that even though it's important to talk about, it's 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 sadly not relevant to the coronavirus situation. But that being said, you're spot on when you're talking about uh, what we call vector borne viruses. So these are things like dengue fever, Zika, chikungunya, um, West Nile, all these kinds of things as the climate changes and climate zones kind of shift from where they used to be to new latitudes and longitudes, um, that is going to change things tremendously because you used to um, not have to worry about certain things because you didn't have the right insects, mosquitoes, or ticks to transmit them. And now we do. Um, So that is incredibly relevant to emerging diseases. That said, it's not per se relevant to this one. Um, So um, for for coronaviruses, um, these guys are, they're not spread by insects. So these are spread um, by, by inhalation. So person to person, we now know this one too is spread person to person. Um, this is more or less like an influenza type of situation where somebody sneezes on their hand, grabs a doorknob, you grab the doorknob right after them, then you get your nose and you've now been exposed to their sneeze juice. It's delightful. Sneeze juice. Um, yeah. That's juice. why I always, it's a technical uh, term. I always um, put, put my, my sleeve over my hand uh, with certain doorknobs. I don't think that makes any difference because I probably then w- wipe my face with my sleeve. Uh, but well, also- that's why it's handy to wear dresses. You know, you can grab the hem oh. of your dress. And oh, all right. But, uh, I'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even. I barely leave my that. house. I'm mostly in the sweats. I think I'll be safe from a virus. Uh, <laughs> what with what with me uh, being self employed now. Okay, so let's talk about. But, um, go, oh, go ahead. Uh, We're not finished. Sorry. I sorry. I I I was I was still um I was still yammering about this. The the one thing that I think is important for this particular um, coronavirus that has emerged, the really big risk factor here. Uh, is something called a wet market and or an open air market, and you see these in a lot of parts of the world. But they're very um, they're very n- notoriously associated with um, with China in particular, and and in Southeast Asia. So sometimes you see like on the on different Netflix shows where you see people kind of wandering through these awesome markets, and they look really interesting. The problem is they're like a public health nightmare because you tend to have livestock that's in some cases still alive and is slaughtered on site for freshness. You have wild animals, you have, um, you have an incredible density of people walking through them. Um, and then you also, uh, because they're open to the outside, you can also have feral cats wandering through. You can have bats roosting in them. You can have, you know, (laughs) rodents wandering around. So it's like this veritable zoo of animals, which means you have an incredible, like 10 billion fold zoo of microbes and they can jump from one species to another species, or they can jump from one species to humans. And if you have all those humans really close together, then they can start jumping from one human to the next human to the next human. And it looks very much like that's what happened here. Okay, now we have to get to just the fact that uh, that its origin is in China and China has a not great history with being transparent about outbreaks. Uh, You can go back to 2002 or three with the SARS outbreak that at first we thought uh, began in Hong Kong and and Vietnam. But later on, history and the truth showed that it began in mainland China. They knew it. And they didn't say, why is China so cagey about this? And and how transparent have they been about this current outbreak that they now have an entire huge city larger than New York quarantined? I mean, that sounds like a pretty big deal. Right. It, it is. They know and something to, maybe that, you know, and, they're not. And, and just to, to add on to that, as of this morning, the news is there are now 15 Chinese cities under lockdown. Oh, wow. And that is now affecting 48 million people. Okay. Isn't, that's uh, incredible, right? Because yesterday. Is that, it, it, well, have we ever seen was, that in, in, in a city no. as large? I thought it was like. No. 
Never, never. And so the other uh, a day and a half ago, they were going to lock down Wuhan. We'd never even seen that before. As of yesterday morning, there were two cities. When I went to bed last night, five cities. I woke up this morning, it's now 15. And so, yes, this, there's 48 million people on lockdown. And so this is, um, and, and this is one of these moments where I look at the action and the data that we currently have and the action being taken are not quite lining up in my head. Um, and the, the, the thing is, if you think about it, and this, this sounds, you know, this, this sounds, um, sort of cold and calculating and we're talking about numbers. So I guess it literally is, but the, um, the thing is you're, we, we have, um, 1300 known cases in China and they have now restricted the movement and locked down 48 million people. If you think about that proportionally, so 13, with respect to those 1300 cases to lock down and the economic impact that that's going to have 48 million people, it feels like a disproportionate response. And so which that, makes you think that it's, it's probably worse than what is being reported. You don't you, you don't want to you want to be careful because you're a professional. Uh, but if you take your professional hat off and integrity in terms of knowing the reporting, knowing the history of China's public health organization, whatever it's called, you think, well, they're, they're, the way it looks, the way they're locking things down, the precautions that they're taking, plus it's Chinese New Year. I think that's important to mention. <laughs> Uh, yes, says absolutely. that this is, this is something they're not telling us. Is that what you're trying to say, but don't want to say because we're on the record? You said it, not me. <laughs> okay, all right. So, um, so that's 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 the thing that that response feels disproportionate to me to the case number, and I I hope that that's because they're acting out of an abundance of caution, but that's. Um, that that's not what we've seen so far, right? Where you had the initial uh, reporting of there's no human to human transmission, right? And um, and that was the original reporting it, it, is that it, they, it, the Chinese authorities were saying there was no human to human transmission. You don't have to worry about this. This is the animals, uh, and but but the truth was they knew that there was human to human transition, and and they can't oh. they couldn't hide it anymore. And so now uh, we know or, that. Or at the very least, there were a lot of us saying, I don't see how you can make that judgment at this point. And so the thought being, isn't it, you know, the other way of approaching this would have been, we do not yet know how this is transmitted. So everyone may be fine, but we don't know that yet. And as opposed to there's no human to human transmission until it became clear that so many more cases were appearing after the the um, market in question had been closed down, and there were a lot of uh, a lot of um, professionals in the community kind of raising our eyebrows and saying, "I, I, I it doesn't make sense to me that you can s- continue to say there's no human human transmission." And then when the announcement was made, yes, there is, and by the way, fourteen healthcare workers are now infected. Um, you know, and this, this piece of information comes out overnight in one announcement. It's sort of like, it it would seem that some of those healthcare workers were, you know, 14 of them didn't just get sick in the last 20 minutes and you made the announcement, you know? So it's, it's when you actually look at the actions and then the, the, kind of the logical announcement is made a little bit later. I, I'm concerned, right? When yeah, you look at your locking down leave. 48 million people during a major holiday. And again, I am hopeful that that is just out of an abundance of caution. Um, and that, you know, the lockdown is perhaps related to the fact that if people were not locked down, they would be traveling for Chinese New Year. Um, but that has, that has not been the, pattern thus far and so, so I, it, i'm hoping the pattern changed but 
Who knows? <laughs> uh, it is now here in the U.S. There are a few cases. I think I read France. Where else is it? And uh, <laughs> in terms of the, our ability to uh, you know, effectively combat this virus, that falls to the CDC. You know a lot about that. But I get worried that because Trump has destroyed other agencies, you know, everything has now corrupted. The EPA is run by coal and, and gas. The Department of Education is run by uh, Jesus and his disciples, the Christian right. And and, and, uh, and is the CDC like now run by an actual virus? Like how how were, how has um, the CDC been destroyed by Trump or, you know, is there funding been cut? Should we be worried about? Yeah, the um the, the CDC is run by an actual an actual virus, you know. There's evasive <laughs> maneuvers going on all okay, over the place. Okay, listen, you know? I, um, you're never going to catch me. I evolve quickly. <laughs> you're never going to make a lot of money here, killing a lot of people. <laughs> Terrible, um, trying to find humor somewhere in this in this terrifying time and and, you, and you, epidemic. That's how we. That's how we still get up in they the morning. Sing, yeah. Um, Yes. Yeah, so as of right now, there haven't been funds. Um, put aside for this or dedicated for this. And there, there have been, you know, for other outbreaks in the past, certainly um, uh, president Obama did that for Ebola and in 2014 and then, and then Zika a couple of years later. Um, It's still early days that hasn't happened yet, but we don't know for sure. Um, The, the CDC's uh, funding level has been kind of hot, hot and cold. There've been some, pieces of good news out of the administration and there's been some how concerned of, are you about the cdc's ability to handle this uh so far so good okay. so far it seems okay um i i'm hopeful that especially since we have cases in the united states that um any kind of gutting would be quickly reprimanded and reversed yeah. um, as we've seen happen with some other things that you know have been attempted where the public says absolutely not and then there's a, a reversal of I'm course sure, I'm, sure, um, I'm sure Trump is all over this I'm sure he's not distracted by the impeachment and watching TV I'm sure he's like is that China it, virus it, well, is the China person virus coming here yet or we should be weird is it just going to stay well, in China you know he, he has laser like focus on, on all things so you know <laughs> oh, right. he's I'm, a you know, genius I'm, all right. So, what about it's a vaccine? It's like a bird dog, really. It's it's, it's incredible. Um, ah, bird dog. <laughs> what about a vaccine? This is what you know the most about. Can we just vaccinate against this? Uh, we cannot because we just hmm. found it, and so we don't have one. Um, so the 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 tricky thing with um with vaccines, and there's actually a, a really um, wonderful commentary that came out this morning. Um, I'll tweet it in a little while because I, of course, being a stable genius myself, cannot quite remember who wrote it, but it was very good. Um, the point here is that when there was an Ebola vaccine that came out, you know, a few months after the news of this outbreak in 2014, uh, the, the point of this commentary was that that really was a very unusual set of circumstances. And part of the, the reason why that worked so well was that that had been under development already and uh, by uh, by scientists at Health Canada and then it was handed off to to um, to a company that uh, is going to have the manufacturing capacity to actually make it um, so that was a very unusual set of circumstances normally what what actually happens is that it takes a really long time to, to actually come up with a vaccine that works well and if you think back to um, some of the vaccines that we have in this country that do work brilliantly well, um, the technology to make them has not changed spectacularly in a very long time. Um, there have been a few new ones that come out with with much more efficient, with much more uh, precise technology. It's uh, the uh, Gardasil vaccine would be a good example of that. Hepatitis B would be another. It, but it's really the, the way that we still make some of these is you pass them in cells and adapt them to a laboratory for hundreds of times. And then they're so weak when you actually put them back into a person that they can't cause disease anymore. Um, and so that takes time to right. do. 
And so, oh, that's uh, okay. I appreciate you explaining that, but that's uh, not necessarily the answer I wanted to hear. Uh, what else, <laughs> Megan? Do I'm, we a, I'm a I'm a barrel of good news. Well, you know? I mean, in your world, you're just being honest. I'm glad that I have you on, and I really appreciate uh, that you joined me today to tell me about this. I have a feeling you're going to be talking, unfortunately, with me and 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 others more about this as it develops. So, what else do we need to know before I let you go about coronavirus that we haven't covered uh, so far? Um, well, actually, you did ask me and I got distracted by something shiny and, and was talking about something different. But you asked, where is this so far? Um, oh, right. Yep. So, yes. Yeah, so, so the, again, the majority of the of the cases are in China, but there have been cha- cases in uh, Japan, in Singapore, in the U.S. Obviously, there have been two confirmed and two others that were under investigation. Um in Vietnam, in Australia, in France, uh, there are some under investigation in the UK. There are um, there have been cases in Taiwan, Thailand. I Jeez. am missing one, but there there have been a uh, Malaysia. Sorry, yeah, that, uh, Malaysia that uh, that we know. Do you worry? I mean, did you, are you always the people that are in your world always just watching and waiting for some big you know virus uh, like the ones that we that, that wiped out so many? I mean, we, there's so much concern about this. How do we? How do we deal with, 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 think about it? I guess you can't say anything on the record that you would want to make people panic. (laughs) Well, the, the, the good news about this virus, such as it is, is that when we look at case numbers and again, the part of the conversation about China and reported case numbers, notwithstanding, since we do now have activity with this virus in other countries, it, gives a a much stronger sense of, okay, how many cases are there? What happens to these people? What's their prognosis? And what what are the transmission dynamics like? And the the patient in Washington, for example, uh, the first one in the United States, Mm -hmm. that was a a patient who had been traveling in Wuhan. And he, um, he reported to the hospital when he heard about this on the news. And he did have symptoms. He wasn't on, you know, he wasn't well, he had mild pneumonia, and he seems like he's gonna, you know, make a complete and full recovery. So that kind of thing is promising, you know, that, that there are patients and perhaps even most patients, again, it, it's hard to know what proportion right now that develop this. They have, you know, not a pleasant illness, but a reasonably mild one. And then they go on to, to recover and be fine. We just don't understand what proportion of patients that is. And of those who get, who become critically ill, we don't know what it is about those patients that make them get so critically ill. And so it, it's really hard to assess the, the risk when we don't, we just don't know those things fundamentally. Yeah. But when we're, we're talking about U.S. cases or cases in France, we, there's a, a, a confidence that all of those types of details will be, you know, shared, made readily available. And, um, and we'll be able to to assess them and as such. And the thing that that gives me a little bit of concern, also though, is we have we've enacted in in the U.S. kind of airport screening. So people have been talking about you know we're we're checking people who've right. come from Wuhan and and whatnot. But the past couple of days, I think, have have led to two kind of two sort of unsettling pieces of information with regard to how effective the airport screening is going to be. And the first is that we now know that a, a certain proportion of the patients who have this don't have fevers. And so in terms of airport screening, part of, of what is what that entails is that if you have anyone who is coming from Wuhan originally, um, and they are, uh, they're going to be checked for, you know, are they coughing? Do they have respiratory signs? Do they have fevers? Well, if they're not, if we now know half of these patients don't get fevers, then that is sort of eyebrow raising in terms of what? would they have gotten through the screen? Um, and then the other piece now is again, that we have so many countries now involved, um, that the screening parameters are going to have to be adjusted almost well, constantly they, in terms of 
Yeah, in terms of how they can. Oh, sorry. Well, I, I just read that the in the past that these airport screenings actually were ineffective and that they didn't actually find anybody that was carrying the virus. And also they're counterintuitive in that a lot of people, it, it, it turns people underground trying to to not come, not get caught because they don't want to get sent back home or whatever. I mean, what is your understanding of the effectiveness of these airport screenings, which on their face, a lot of people might feel safe by? I'm like, oh, I'm glad that we're doing that. But the research apparently, and maybe you disagree, but what I heard is it's, it, they, they don't work. It, I think it, it it's, it's a little bit nuanced. They can work under certain circumstances and that, you know, when, when they have those uh, during the SARS outbreak, right, they put those massive fever screeners, like, so they looked almost like metal detectors, but they were thermal imagers, right? So anybody who had elevated body, body temperature would get you know, pulled out of line, not allowed on the airplane. Something like that is helpful in cutting things down. But as you point out, when it's known that somebody is is going to be um, screened or um, otherwise detained for having an infection that they don't want to call to the attention of anybody. Yeah, it makes them divert their travel and, and try to get around it. And we actually had a, an example of that in the U.S. several years ago. It wasn't it, it wasn't during SARS, but this was actually a, a patient who had extensively drug resistant tuberculosis infection and he was, um, he knew if he came back into the U.S. Uh, that he was going to be put into quarantine and ended up trying to come back in through Canada and then was arrested at the border. And it, so it was, wow. uh, it, it, it's, you're right. It, what does happen is that people then try to divert and, and get around it because, you know, if you try to think from a, you know, from an empathy standpoint, what if that were you? What if you learned uh, you lived in Wuhan, you weren't sick, but you knew there was a chance you could become sick because everybody's stuck here and no one can leave. Escape from Wuhan. Yeah. I mean, it makes it's perfect human behavior. Yeah, it is. It's like I I need to get out of here because yeah. I don't want to get sick. I don't want my kids to get sick. And, and it's it's just what humans uh. do. And so when we're, you know, in in the U.S. looking at something thousands of miles away, it's tempting to say, God, why would people try to sneak around a screen? It's there for a reason. But if you were the one, you know, who potentially could be affected by it, it it's a different yeah. feeling. It's a very yeah. kind of terrifying it's like a visceral reaction. Of course. Uh, all right. Uh, Megan May is at the University of New England. So glad that you reached out to me. I will look forward to getting updates from you on this. Uh, follow her on Twitter at M May. Uh, I'm sorry. At Dr. May five at Dr. May M A Y five. Uh, she's tweeting about this and all these other issues. And uh, I'm so glad we have an expert like you available to us to learn from this and have a, an actual great, thoughtful, nuanced conversation. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much for having me. All right. I keep saying us like I'm on Sirius XM and I have this crew. <laughs> That's like, it's just me. It's a thank you for talking to me. I feel like I know a lot more. And by us, I suppose I mean everybody listening. Megan, yeah, thank the you. The royal us. <laughs> the royal us. Megan May, everybody. Okay. So yesterday I talked to Dr. May around, I don't know, one in the afternoon, and we talked about how we'd stay in close touch because as this is a virus, and uh, it, it's, it's being updated minute by minute by the experts and by media outlets. And so it's now Sunday night, a, a little after seven Eastern, and uh, Megan, Dr. May was able to join me again to give me an update. You watched what a, a Harry Potter movie with your child this evening? I sure did. The youngest one's first viewing of The Order of the Phoenix. You know, uh, if they're PG-13 movies, the rule is once they've read the book, they can see the movie. That's so, exactly you know. how we did it. It's a rite of passage. Well, thank exactly. you for fitting it's the whole us. Thing. Thank you for fitting me in after you did that, um, because there are some updates that uh, have developed since we spoke yesterday, and I'm sure there will be by the time folks are listening to this. Uh, first folks listening to it on Monday. It's a podcast. People listen to it maybe for weeks later. But number, uh, yeah, we got three updates here. And number one are just about the cases, the numbers. What do we know? Okay, so... In a little bit over 24 hours, that case number from China has jumped by over a thousand. 
So when we talked yesterday, we were talking about around 1,300 people, and now we're talking 2,500 people. Uh, we're also talking about a more than double number of deaths in association with this. So now nice. we're now above 50. Um, okay, so uh, total from ch- or from China anyway. But that's actually an important point because as of now, and I just double checked this nine seconds before we started talking, uh, there haven't been any deaths outside of China yet. So there have been cases in multiple countries. No one has yet died. So that's good news, okay. right? Um, so if some of these um kind of urban legends that we're all hearing about were panning out um, where, you know, they're like bodies in the streets and the whole nine yards. Uh, we would probably have seen at least one death outside of China at this point, And we haven't seen that. So that's slightly promising. Okay. Um, okay. So that's number one. Number two, the head of the uh, team that's running the response in China He had a press conference this morning where he announced that it appears as though infected people are starting to shed the virus and are able to transmit it before they have symptoms of it. Uh Uh-oh. Exactly. And so... That's bad for uh, some pretty obvious reasons. Exactly. So we all know that somebody sneezing in your face is, is not a good thing and you should like avoid the person sneezing on you. Uh, However, if the person next to you looks on the airplane, looks perfectly fine, um, and you don't realize that they're shedding virus on you, then that's that's unfortunate. And one thing to keep in mind is we all, uh, whether or not we, we realize it, are somewhat familiar with this idea because this is exactly what happens with the annual um, stomach bug virus, norovirus, that most of us who have kids have had to deal yes. with on, a, yes, on an have. annual basis. Yeah. You know, It's almost as though it just tears through your house no matter what you do. Yep. And the reason for that is that people who are infected start shedding virus before you know they're sick. So before you know to start Lysoling everything under the sun in your house, um, everybody's already been shedding virus. It's a little bit too late. So it sounds like that's exactly the situation we have here with this novel coronavirus. And that is something that gives some context to the scale of the lockdown that we're seeing in China. I mentioned to you yesterday that something about that wasn't quite sitting right to me because it seemed like a very disproportionate response. Given this new piece of information that was announced this morning, that suddenly makes a little more sense in context. Okay, so that's number two. Number three that's is... A, that's uh, a big one. But. Yeah, that's a huge, huge uh, development in terms of the way that's being transmis- uh, transmitted and in terms of the way that it was uh, being reported. Your suspicions, unfortunately, proved right. And number three is that uh, there is a supply, a testing supply shortage. to be supplies available for the the clinicians to actually run the test and get a positive or a negative. And those testing supplies are running very, very low in China. In other parts of the world, um, in the US, for example, in Canada, in Europe, in Australia, that's not a problem. But in China, it appears like it's becoming a problem. The reason I bring this up is that I am... Um, Wondering if we're going to start seeing a slowing in the number of confirmed cases. But if we do see that in the next few days, we have to keep in mind that there's a shortage of these supplies. And so it may not be possible to confirm more cases. And so be aware. It's it's an uh, important piece of context to keep in mind. Absolutely. Uh, that's a really important piece of context to keep in mind. And anything else? What about that uh, GoFundMe that you DM me? Yes. So um, I had sent over a link to a GoFundMe. So this was 
set up by by a scientist in Canada in, in conjunction with the first confirmed case in Toronto. And basically, the um, the point here and what this money is being raised for is for containment medical supplies, uh, what we call PPE or personal protective equipment for healthcare workers. So I mentioned yesterday to you, Pete, that there have been multiple healthcare workers who are infected because they really are on the front lines here right. taking care of these patients. Uh, we've had at least one die. Uh, he was a an ENT physician. He was in his very early 60s, perfectly healthy guy. Uh. Unfortunately, he lost his life to this. So what this GoFundMe is intended to do is to provide N95 face masks and eye protection and gloves and sterile equipment to help keep these healthcare workers safe because unfortunately those two are starting to run into short supplies. And when you think about the logistics of the lockdowns in several Chinese cities, people can't get out, supplies can't get out, waste can't get out, and things are having a hard time getting in. And so it's critically important that we find ways to help support these healthcare workers who really are trying to protect the rest of the world. Absolutely. All right. Well, all really important. I, I greatly appreciate that update. I'm going to probably have to keep checking in with you. But if people want to know more, of course, uh, if, first of all, I'll link in the show notes to that GoFundMe that Dr. May just said. And oh, then thank you so much. Yeah, and I'll tweet about it and absolutely follow her on Twitter for updates as well. That's at DRMay5. And uh, thank you to the University of New England for uh, allowing us to have you join us. Dr. Megan May, I really appreciate you joining me on Sunday night. We'll, we'll keep, uh, keep watch on your Twitter and get more updates as we go along here. Great. Thanks again for talking about it. Absolutely. Thank you, Megan. And guest number two for today's episode of Stand Up is my brother, Brian. Everybody loved him the first time he was on. Really smart guy, very influential on in my life, always thinking uniquely and radically. And I wanted to get his take on Bernie Sanders, impeachment, and the latest news. A little tiny phone issue here, but I, I think it was no, no big deal. Every once in a while when I was just talking over him. But uh, I thought we had a great conversation. I think you're really going to like this. Here's my conversation with my brother from last night. Okay, now joining me, one of the your favorite guests so far on the podcast. Uh, he is my big brother, Brian. He is in the woods, in the Catskills. I'm in the home studio. Get his new book, Present as Prologue, a Gen Zero novella. Look up Brian Dominic on Amazon order right now. We had a two and a half, two hour conversation. Uh, rave reviews of that conversation. And I wanted to have you on to give a bit of a rant or your take on some recent things. So thank you for uh, joining me. I'm glad you could make the time, bro. Oh, yeah, sure. I'm squeeze you right in. I do. Right. There may be some dog movement in the background that I can't. I'm not actually in the woods. I live in a house in the woods, just to be clear. Oh, well, did you think I was insinuating that you were somehow my, uh, living like my side of the mountain in a hollowed out tree? I mean, <laughs> that might be right. next. The book isn't exactly flying off the shelves. Uh, well, we're gonna we're gonna make that change. Present as prologue. Go buy it right now. If you're listening, go buy this book right now. What are you waiting for? Okay, <laughs> uh, a couple things I wanted to talk with you about: Bernie Sanders and uh, con the constitutional crisis that uh, you you think that we're in. Uh, but first of all, let's go back to the last podcast where you were a pretty big you were you were in wide agreement with Professor Eric Siegel that uh, when it comes to what we're seeing in terms of impeaching the president. It's not about legal analysis, it's about political analysis. You agree with him? Why? Yeah, I really I really like what he said about that there is really no legal analysis there. There there's no legal actors. These are people performing theater in a situation where uh there's no actual chance at affecting the outcome. And I think his I think Eric's point about you know, stretching out, stretching it out to a 22 hour case to me under those circumstances did not make any sense either. I was I had been thinking the same thing. So when he said it, I was like, right on. This is a really weird way to go about acting as if you think that democracy is a possibility here. This is such a pantomime and it seems so fake and it seems so insincere. And I'm so unimpressed by the Democrats performance here. This does not seem like they are actually trying to make change in our world. It seems like they're trying to make a point 
which has long since been made. I mean, you either have figured out what the heck's going on here or you are not interested. That's how it seems to me. What the heck is going on here? Well, I mean, it, what it, what they're saying is going on here has happened. That seems clear enough. I'm not challenging their narrative. Right, right, exactly. The extortion of a foreign country. And and most importantly, frankly, to me, uh, uh, obstruction of Congress. So the second charge is pretty solid to me because it happened right in front of all of us, right? So this is this is open and shut to me. I'm I'm totally fine with that. But the fact that the Democrats are not going to be able to affect any change with this suggests that we've got a major constitution problem in our country where the way we can see the facts on the ground are that the guy's guilty, that we do believe it's an impeachable offense. I mean, I don't really understand our country's priorities there because we don't consider war crimes to be impeachable offenses, but crimes against the Democrats are so. But whatever, like technically it's <laughs> technically I agree he did something that's totally wrong and totally inappropriate for a president. Um, you know, it wouldn't be the first on my list of things to impeach him for, but there it is. And yet nothing is being done. I mean, nothing is going to happen. It's not going to have an outcome of removal or even censure, right? I mean, it, it, this doesn't even come out as a warning to a president in the end of this. It comes out as a like a weird black mark, I guess, like the same black mark that Clinton got that nobody well, really, really thinks about. And arguably, it makes him a martyr for the upcoming election as well. Yeah, so it could have it could have unpredictable or unwanted side effects. So, yeah. All right, but let's go back a step. Just in terms of the Constitution, the thing that really is is worth mentioning and always in every conversation about what's happening right now, and just to, is that the United States Senate is not a representative body, and right now the Republicans control the Senate, and they are therefore controlling this trial, and they are obstructing Congress, they are preventing documents and evidence from being called, and yet the President of the United States. Did not uh, get the win the popular vote. Hillary Clinton got three million more votes, and the Senate is also a minority representation. The United States Senate, where Republicans have the majority, a representative of a vast minority of Americans. Yet they are deciding whether or not we hear any evidence or hear any witnesses in this case. Yeah. What about that? That I, I I think I explained it well. I wonder if anyone outside, I haven't looked at this, but maybe there's international news that's actually portraying it exactly like you're putting it. How undemocratic this sort of democratic looking process even is, because it definitely is not being conveyed that way. I haven't even heard it said that way by anybody here until you just said it. So no, people say that it's like a constant reminder. People keep bringing it up. Oh, by the way. OK. All right. Fine. Yeah. I, I don't know what I, I consume probably really different stuff than a lot of people. So I don't know that I have my my finger on the pulse of what people are hearing. But you're mostly Dr. Phil based. That's that's correct. Yeah. Yeah. That and uh, goop. Goop is this. <laughs> <laughs> so you're trying to think I want to say goop. it's Dr. Phil and goop all day, but I could not come up with goop. This is not going well. OK, so. What else about uh, the the impeachment or constitution or can we, or do do we move on to your your Bernie Sanders material? I don't have I don't have material. You just asked me to do this. Okay, I know, but you got to you got to rant. You got to rant. You have to rant at me. First of all, Bernie Sanders. Are we can we move on from impeachment or? I don't know. Have we solved that? I I, I want to hear your opinion. I think because. Well, I don't think last time we argued about this, you seem to think that this this act of his was so important that he needed to be impeached for it. And I just kept asking, you know, like, what are we going to get from this? So it sounds like you have moderated a little bit about that. OK, no, no, I, no. I, I think that the 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 converse of, of, of what you're saying is not what are we going to get for this? Democrats responsibility, Congress's responsibility, rather not Democrats, is to. Uphold the Constitution in an ideal world. When the President of the United States abuses the Constitution and commits the types of crimes and abuses that he's committed, they have to impeach him, whether or not it's likely. But they that don't the send on the other- such worse things. So what 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 silliness is happening when people are letting war crimes go, but not letting crimes against the elections go? I, I just I don't live in the same like world of morals. He wasn't going to get, but he wasn't going to get impeached by the Senate, and he wasn't going to get the unanimous vote 
from Democrats in the House on these war crimes that right. you speak of. Of course he wasn't. He, this country they have to do, this so they country have to be pragmatic. No, the whole system is a fraud. That's exactly my point. Fine, we don't fine. we don't we don't hold presidents accountable for anything from war crimes all the way down to crimes agreed, against the election. Agreed. All right. That's a problem. But you, but I live in and want to be realistic in the stupid, shitty system that we have, not the ideal one that we should have. And in the system that we have, he was only going to be impeached for his shenanigans in Ukraine. Well, I, don't, I, I really don't know about that. I mean, well, we do know about that because they never were going to bring up war crimes. No one even talked about that. Number well, one, I'm, what are the war crimes that Trump committed, by the way? There were. I, well, he did just commit one for sure. It, okay, uh, but killing so many. But no, I know I wasn't talking about Trump. I'm, but this is the problem. If you don't clean up your bad actors, you get more right. bad actors. And then it yeah, looks really Trump. weird yeah. when you want to cherry pick the, the reasons. And you have to go into these moral crevices that we've found to, for this weird crime that he committed, which, frankly, I mean, I think the reason there's a giant yawn across America is I think we sort of all thought this was happening and we just didn't know about it. And now we go, oh, OK, I guess this wasn't on the up and up before. And maybe maybe politicians weren't working these angles, but we're so cynical about it. This didn't jar me in terms of like, oh, oh, my goodness, he's going to shake up our democracy with this move. Are you kidding me? <laughs> like in this country, that's yeah. not going to be the like an announcement that Joe Biden's son is being investigated in Ukraine is going to make a flash in the media here. And no voter is going to take it into account for a single second. This was not a threat to our democracy. I get that. Like you have to put your foot down and not let him do it in bigger and other ways. Like I'm, I'm down with all that, but it just seems like a mild violation given the things we've let presidents do. And I that's said. why, a, that's why a Donald Trump can come in and go, Hey, they let these guys commit war crimes one after the next. Right. right. I could get away with anything must be. You're not, you're not, you're not wrong about that. Uh, I agree with you about that. All right. Let me uh, ask you about Bernie Sanders though. Okay. So in general, uh, how do you feel about the burn? Do you feel the burn by the way? The burn in any way, shape, or form, but I I guess I prefer him on some level, but I would take him or Warren. I'd kind of take any Democrat because I don't think they're going to make all that much of a different splash from each other. I do think that Bernie will get resisted from within his party and most of his biggest uh, uh, pushes won't go through. Like I, I'm just cynical about this stuff, so I don't get excited. That said, I, I'd prefer him slightly. In some, in most ways, I guess, but I would take Warren. Like that seems like she'd be probably better than any president in my lifetime. So that's that's a good thing, I guess. But I, I don't understand what's happening right now among Democrats who are going nuts about these. The fans of these two are doing a repeat of 2016. They're biting each other's heads off. Like Twitter is my Twitter feed is a ridiculous stream of people taking shots at each other. And it really seems like the attacks on on Bernie and his supporters are out of hand. Well, what about the sexism charges of the Bernie bros? The Bernie bros, I think, are there. And they're one of the main reasons I never got on with Bernie in the first place. They're a certain element in the left. Um, Brochalists is another term for them. <laughs> I never heard that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Well, you yeah, you've you've probably met a couple. You've probably run into a couple. Bro, I don't understand it. I was talking about this the other night and I was saying, you know, you, you taught me anti-racism and anti-sexism. You taught me that in my adolescence. You've con you've given me a continuing education, a few punches in the ribs along the ways when I've uh, misstepped here and there. But but I, my understanding is part of being kind of a, a liberal progressive, certainly a leftist is to be anti-sexist, much less anti-racist. And there seems to be an element that supports Bernie that I guess once, what, how would you describe it? The economic policies and tax policies that he supports, but not necessarily, or at least, uh, you know, they're, w w what am I missing about their anti-sexism and anti-racism or their their lack of that? They don't. It's not absent. It's just way, way far in the backseat, I think, because they have the analysis and they actually can talk the talk in most cases, but they don't prioritize it. They do prioritize economics. And of course, they make the they have the one reasonable argument, which is obviously, you know, economic progress helps women, helps people of color, that sort of thing. That's also, I think, the camp that Bernie comes from. It is one of the reasons I'm not super thrilled about him. But to me, that 
is nowhere near a reason, you know, not to support him or to try to tank his campaign. I mean, is what I'm really worried about, what really seems to be happening. I think he could do better on all these issues. Um, but, you know, there's a there's it, and the criticisms are all valid and I like hearing them. I think that they're important. Um, I'm I was glad when Black Lives Matter activists uh, came on stage and took the mic from him and kind of made a statement a while back. I think that made an impact on Bernie. I think it, you know, opened his mind up to some stuff, um, you know, and I don't think that that stuff should be constantly disrupting campaigns or whatever. But that's how candidates are going to, you know, understand who actually wants to get behind them. And if they respond well to that kind of stuff, I think they actually gain allies from, you know, they gain supporters from those groups. And if they respond terribly, they lose them. So he has not always responded great. Your biggest criticism or concern is that Democrats are eating each other alive the same way they did with Hillary and and Bernie back in uh, the 2016. Yeah. And it just it just seems to me that that they pin their hopes on some sort of like as if as if either Warren or Sanders or really any of the others. I mean, you know, Tulsi Gabbard has fans who are super, super into her. Steyer does now. The Yang gang. Like there's people. Who ha- who Who's super into Steyer? Really? Uh, yeah, he's he's he spiked recently. <laughs> Aren't you a Steyer buyer? Hey, hey, there's a video of 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 Bernie Sanders what? like elbowing Steyer off the like out of his way on the stage at some event where only the two of them showed up. And the only signs you can see in the audience are Steyer signs. Oh, uh, do- he probably paid. Them. They're pretty, probably, probably, probably. I don't know how it is, but anyway, point being, there's there's no way that your certainty about how great any one of these candidates can be should should be considered worth tanking, you know, the Democratic ticket over. And that's what they're doing when they start eating each other alive. And it isn't because they scare they ruin other voters for anybody. It's just that they toxify each other and then they won't come out and vote for this person. You know, like they can't bring themselves to do it. How much of that do you think is a product of like your reaction and analysis of that or anybody else's is a product of what we see on social media in terms of the sniping going on there versus what may or may not happen at the Iowa caucuses or the primaries? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to acknowledge that in what I'm saying. Or is it just a feedback loop, really? I think it's just with a certain a certain significant portion of their fans who are these engaged like Twitter user type people. Who, who do become so turned off to now Elizabeth Warren because she accused Bernie Sanders of this thing. So if you're a Sanders fan, now you're really bitter against Warren for like three little reasons or whatever. And a lot of them will not be able to bring themselves to vote for this person over it. And that I find just really hard to understand given, you know, who's who's going to win if, if they don't come together and do this. And I say this as someone whose vote doesn't count in New York State. So... You know, I may I may spare myself the indignity of voting for president this uh, this year because it doesn't make any difference. And, you know, it's not like someone I give a crap about that I would that I would support is going to win. And it's not like it's an office that I think should exist. So. Uh, So but let me ask you about uh, the whole the whole Joe Rogan thing. So Joe Rogan basically is one of the most uh, influential People in media, if not the, certainly the most popular person in in podcasts, one of the most famous people in America. He's got a massive, massive following. You could argue that he's very influential over the way that they think. And he basically kind of nonchalantly, I think, as Barry Weiss was on his show, she, she asked him who he, he liked and he thought it through. And he said he talked about Bernie Sanders and why he, he generally, generally uh, supports Bernie Sanders, who he had on the podcast and had a really interesting conversation with. And the Sanders campaign used that clip as a basically a campaign ad showing Joe Rogan basically endorsing him. What is your reaction? Yeah, it was a pretty light cause... endorsement. It was I'm probably going to vote for Bernie Sanders is what he yeah. actually said. But if, but yeah, people are running with that as an endorsement and whatever. I, it's it's it makes sense for Joe Rogan to endorse Bernie Sanders. I'm I'm pleased. I mean, he, he he's being the person he claims to be on politics. He's always said he's a liberal. You know, he's he's been pretty consistent about that. And then he has right wingers on. He says really awful shit. He yells, you're a man at a trans woman. Like, you know, there's gross stuff that like makes makes it why I definitely wouldn't want Joe Rogan to be president. But I think we all agree <laughs> Joe Rogan, first of all, probably <laughs> would agree there. Yeah. But the idea that now you're going to start canceling people because they either accept an endorsement or even, you know, rebroadcast it, 
okay, I mean, you know, criticize him for, you know, maybe he should have said, I don't agree with Joe on everything or whatever, whatever you need people to say, who knows? But like, that's really the difference here is that they didn't couch this right. Of course they had to use it. Like that's, it's crazy to, to, to just, I mean, I mean, like, why would you reject all those potential voters by, you know, dumping on that? I mean, right. they, they did this with uh, Jenk, uh Uyghur, too. Uyghur. Uyghur. Yeah. Is that, oh, dude, what's his? I don't know who gives a shit. Cenk Uyghur is they found some comments of his from uh, a long time ago. And and Bernie had to like d- take uh, retract his his endorsement. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, well, what do you think about that idea in general? The the kind of the cancel culture, I guess it's called that if if someone in this case said something a really long time ago that they should be deleted their endorsement there. I mean, like, I hate that shit. Yeah, we I don't evolve. Know. We mature. We change. I mean, if I'm if I if some guy murders somebody and goes to prison for 18 years and gets educated and then becomes the leader of the, you know, uh, uh, re- reforming and, and, and teaching scared straight. And he's a really great guy now. Maybe you got his legal degree like he's he's changed. People change. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I'm less, I'm less upset about a lot of this stuff than most people are probably because I've been around it for a lot longer. And I kind of, I feel like I, I understand how it generally has tended to temper itself in kind of the left over the last period, but it does seem to have, yeah, it does seem to have climbed onto a new, a new tier of power that I never really saw it at before. And it's, it's kind of terrifying and it does not seem to be much of a, a mitigating force to it. There doesn't seem to be anything that like keeps that throttles it, that keeps it in control. So, you know, what is usually uh, accurate criticism of something turns into like out and out hostility on this huge scale, you know, and then, yeah, the, the idea of like holding things from that distance against somebody. I mean, it, it just is this strange thing where I wonder what people think the the United States Congress is where this guy wants to go in and do votes on your behalf. He's not he's not going to go and he doesn't have to represent you, you know, the way that you would speak or the way that you would exactly want someone to think. You have to look at their policies and are they going to do this stuff right? They're all kind of creepy, probably like people who want to do this stuff kind of bother me. In the first place, if you want to go and have that much power over other people, it kind of weirds me out in the first place. I don't have a lot of hope for you, except that maybe you'll do some good stuff while you're there. Maybe you will. But I'm not trying to be best friends with any of these people that want to be in these halls of power. They're not my kind of person, but I, I would rather have people there that have a record of fighting on the right side of issues, you know, and that you can believe are going to do that and get things done and have energy behind them. So, yeah, I... I don't understand this like pure as I, I if we had a real democracy that was really worth fighting over, I could definitely see getting in the trenches on the details and being very purist about it. But honestly, we don't have that. So what we really need to do is unseat people that are not as good as the people that we can put in. That's the best that we have in front of us right now. Uh, that's a, a fair way of putting it. All right. Thank you. For your uh, always unique, original, radical, uh, what is the opposite of groupthink analysis on all of these issues. That's uh, my big brother, Brian. You should go buy his novel, his Gen Zero novella, present as prologue. And follow him on Twitter at Brian Dominic. All right, that's pretty much it. One more thing before we go, my appearance on the New Zealand TV show, The project. They billed me for some reason as their Washington correspondent. Whatever. I'll take it. Happy to be there telling them about impeachment. Before I go, make sure that you subscribe on Patreon. Could not do the podcast three times a week without your paid subscriptions. Over 300 people doing that now on Patreon.com slash Pete Dominic. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Pete Dominic. Thank you very much for that. Give us a rating wherever you're listening to the podcast. And now here is my appearance on The Project from New Zealand Television, where I learned the word cura, 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 not cura, cura is like a greeting. So I tried to open with it. I pronounced it better when I was on TV. So it's really unlikely they'll find him guilty. And we're joined by Washington correspondent Pete Dominic now. And Pete, if the Senate is likely to acquit the president, isn't this all just a bit of a waste of time? 
Well, first of all, Jesse, Nadine, Jeremy, Michelle, great to be with you. Cura from the fo frozen tundra of the Northeast United States, where we have all gone mad. The answer to your question is Democrats have to do this. This is their job. They have to uphold the Constitution. If the president of the United States or a petty criminal commits a crime, in this case, an abuse of power, he or she, someday maybe she, hopefully, has to be held responsible. If the Democrats didn't follow through with this, they would all be voted out. Uh, how big a deal is this? Put this into perspective, perhaps, um, in the history of U.S. politics. Uh, that's a great question. I think it's the biggest deal of our lifetime in U.S. politics. I think this is far, far bigger than what we saw in history with Nixon and Watergate in the in the early 70s, because the, the crimes that were that are being alleged against the president here are, are much more serious and they are much more numerous by this president. Our president, the United States, is being accused of extorting a foreign government, a friend of ours, saying, if you don't give me dirt on my domestic opponent, I'm not going to give you the military aid that our Congress uh, guaranteed to you. It is a massive scandal, and there has been nothing like this, certainly in my lifetime, and I would argue the generation prior with Nixon. Dark days. Any chance this will backfire? Any chance this will just make Trump supporters love him even more, the victim, the martyr, the prior? Oh, that's guaranteed. It's guaranteed that they will love him even more when he most likely gets acquitted by the Senate, when all of these Senate Republicans vote to acquit him, when there's a sham trial, which is trending here in the U.S., as is, uh, as is a, there's a whole bunch of cover-up is trending here in the U.S. Yeah, he's going to be, continue to be popular with Republicans who have supported him, in particular, and maybe even more popular because, yeah, he's going to look like a martyr now. There's no doubt about that. We're very divided here in the good old U.S. of A. Pete, if the unlikely, very unlikely event that they did toss Trump out, what would that even look like? I mean, he's unlikely to go quietly, right? Oh, it, no, that's a great question. And it, no, he is very unlikely to go quietly. It would be a mess because Donald Trump knows quite clearly that without the shield of his office, he's possibly and even likely to go to jail. So he's going to say it's a big coup. It's a big hoax, hoax, but fruitlessly, guys, because the Department of Defense, the United States military and the Secret Service are not going to defend him but guaranteed to be ugly and to be a real mess if it can get any uglier here in the U.S. Thanks for your time tonight, Pete Dominic. Guys, thank you very much for having me. If anybody has a guest room, I'd love to, well, just ask you for a friend. Amazing. Listen to that rowdy studio audience there they had down there in New Zealand. All right, let's let a little bit of Kobe Bryant take us out. Episode 39. Once upon a time, there was a young basketball player who had dreams of becoming one of the greatest basketball players of all time. My name is Kobe Bryant. I'm 17 years old. I have the hunger, the motivation, and the desire to be the best possible basketball player that I could be. He worked day and night every day for years and years and years and years and years. And as time went on, 20 years had passed and he felt that he had accomplished all that he set out to accomplish. But what he come to realize is that the goal that he set out initially of becoming the greatest of all time was a very fickle one. And what he realized that the most important thing in life is how your career moves and touches those around you and how it carries forward to the next generation. Did he realize that's what makes true greatness? Well, the story would be about transformation of a kid looking inwardly to then growing up and understanding the importance and the power he's looking outward. It's a great feeling to know that you set a goal for yourself. And you were able to reach that goal and to not get that. If I had the power to turn back time, I would never use it. I don't think about it. Because then every moment that you go through means absolutely nothing, but you can always go back and do it again.
So it loses its flavor, it's, it loses its, its beauty. When things are final, you know, moments won't ever come again. To be able to have the power to go back and re-experience those things is, it's silly to me. When you take that jersey off for the final time, how do you think you're gonna feel? Very at peace with it, and um, I'm very thankful, you know, for the, for the 20 years that I've had. And, um, you know, ready to go.